Welcome my friends, this is Maniacal Incorporated, and over the last couple of days a new trailer has been released for Great Houses of Caldaria. This is a game that I've been following for a while. I streamed it over on Twitch when it came out on Steam Next Fest, and when I'm able to do so, when it comes out on full release, I'm going to be playing it over on my second channel, Maniacal R&D. So do go and check the description below for links to both of those if you want to keep up with all the news around Great Houses of Caldaria. Now I've also made a couple of videos on this in the past playthrough of the demo, so I'll link those above, and I'm not going to go through those too much and discuss what was in them. If you're actually interested in the trade aspects, the city building aspect of the game, and managing your workforce, you can go and check some of those demos. What I want to look at is the elements that are kind of revealed to us in the trailer today that we maybe haven't gotten to see in previous demos. Now, for those of you hearing about this maybe for the first time, what exactly is Great Houses of Caldaria? In a game like Civilization, you play as a nation or a culture, and you're focused predominantly with nation building. In Crusader Kings 3, you play as a single character, and you're basically focusing on the kind of the roleplay aspects, the RPG aspects of building that character. In Great Houses of Caldaria, you play as the entire family. So in CK3, for example, if your character has a daughter, you can marry that daughter off to organize alliances, but they're gone. You're not really going to ever hear from them again, unless they, or one of their children, later push claims to your titles, or maybe if their spouse dies and you're able to invite them back to your court. Here in Great Houses of Caldaria, you're going to be constantly receiving events for all of the members of your family, which is going to have really interesting implications for the multiplayer game. And I'm not too sure how that's going to work if you can maybe marry off a member of your family to the family of another player. And can you then use them to commit intrigue against that player? It's entirely possible. So whereas CK3 in particular focuses more on the roleplay and the war and the conquest part of uh, ruling an empire, this game focuses much more on the intrigue. Uh, court intrigue and court politics, and that's an itch that has been left unscratched by CK3. Uh, it is moving with some DLC and some uh, developments and releases of recent to kind of go a bit more in that direction, but I think Great Houses of Caldaria has the option uh, to do that in a way that we haven't really seen in any game to date. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a look at the Founders trailer to take a look at some aspects of the game that I haven't seen in any of the previous demos. And uh, this is for the Founders Pack, or the Founders Edition, which is coming out on the 20th of July. There are three tiers to it, and the bottom tier is $19.99, uh, which will get you a copy of the game, and that represents a 25% discount on the cost of the game when it goes on full sale. And depending on the tier that you go for, there are a few other extra goodies. So this is the Founders Trailer. And already we can see we have Departure for the Isle of Orsa. Iris Tulliers, so this is the family that's going to basically serve as the kind of the, the subject of this demo. Uh, the Tulliers family, and actually here they are down the side. The crown rests on the head of the individual who is the head of the family. And then we have these other members of the family with little icons representing which of the industries they are overseeing. So this person is the overseer, basically, of the uh, the farmers, the grain farmers. This person is overseeing the vineyards where the grapes are made. Uh, this person is overseeing the huntsmen, who are the, uh, the herdsmen, I think, who make leather and hides. This person doesn't have a job, and this person, person doesn't have a job. These are all things that I would have covered in previous videos. Uh, but what's new here, well, it's kind of new, uh, taking a journey to the Isle of Orsa to participate in the election of the ranks of Caldaria. So this is something that we kind of barely see in CK3, and it's things like this that I, I think will make this game really interesting to possibly make a Dune mod. I don't think you could make a mod for Dune in CK3. You could, but you'd be losing a lot of the court intrigue and the politics. There are various different titles, ranks, positions, and instead of the king or the emperor just handing those out, 
uh, council positions in CK3, here, there's effectively a competition. You have to vie for these positions if you want them. So we'll start up the trailer. It is the year 1314 of our emperor. Here's the Iron and the Borsa. Conclave. So here is uh, what the kind of the diplomacy screens look like. I have forgotten what some of these values mean. I think these are what our families think of each other and what the actual individuals themselves think of each other. Uh, here we have the values uh, diplomacy, economy, intrigue, and military. So of this individual person. So in the same way in CK3 as you would have five stats, you have these four here. And I'm not too sure what these numbers across the bottom mean. Maybe that's progress towards increasing by one. And we have various different traits, impatient, vengeful, benevolent. Uh, the time has come for all noble houses to announce what title they would be most eligible for. The selection will be conducted in order of hierarchy. So we have, at the very least, we have an emperor, we have dukes, we have counts, and we have barons. And in descending order, they're basically going to select what titles they want within the empire. Nears. The despicable house of Fonteroig. Divils. So this is an enemy house, or it's a rival house. They're a barony. So there's the family's name, and that's the, the region that they're running. And we do not like them. Not nice. Uh, these figures represent, I believe, their spy defense, their intrigue defense, and their martial or military defense. So this might be stone walls and fortification levels. This is their uh, network security. Do they have an antivirus? Spies and spy catchers and things like that. To steal. So this is the next part that we're interested in. Here is the actual court positions. These are the baronial ranks, uh, which means that there are also ranks at count level and baron level, or there are titles that you can uh, go for. And we can see here, we have a little, this is our family, this is the Tullier's family, and there's a little crown over here, so they are currently serving as the Herald of Goodwill, is my understanding. The titles give, well there you go, uh, title holder, Tullier's, uh, payment consumption and happiness growth is 10% more efficient. Gain the reputation heartfelt. And we can see here, for example, court librarian will give you plus two, will give the head of your household plus two to all of their stats. And then plus one to maybe something like prestige, I'm not really too sure. Uh, major domo of the court, which is kind of uh, steward. Uh, plus three to economy. And plus 5 to taxation level. Captain of logistics, plus 10 to taxation level. Uh, that would be production bonus, I think, for captain of refinement. I thought it was refinement as in a refined cultural air, but it's refinement as in actually refining things. And then court schemer, not really too sure what, uh, what either of those two uh, traits mean. So there's plus 10 to happiness, maybe plus 10 to prestige again. Uh, plus 10 to carrots, not too sure. And here are rank points. So we can see that everyone has points for the positions that they're going for. They're ordered in uh, the, the list of, um, of points. Uh, we can see it's kind of tight here between these two for Captain of Logistics. And there's going to be ways that you can influence the court. That you can basically curry favor with other families to increase your score. And uh, some of the things that are happening... Uh, characters in other courts is giving us 10 points. Baronial appeals, comital appeals, ducal appeals. I'm not too sure is that appealing to specific uh, dukes, appealing to people for support. Is that what that means? So that's giving us a good chunk of support towards uh, gaining the title. Defensive war participation uh, is, also uh, is also helping with the, with the Herald of Goodwill. And uh, we're being told that those divils, the Fonteroig, the, oh, the devils, they're combating us for the Herald of Goodwill. We can actually see that's them there. They're fighting for the position Captain of Refinement. I'm not too sure is the insinuation that they're maybe spreading negative intrigue about us to try and knock down our points, but it looks like we're fairly secure in this position. Our title, we worked so hard to earn. 
Not the feckless house. And we actually just saw there, actually. Uh, I'm not too sure what the order is in which the families take their positions. So there's there's some ranking in which you apply. And of course, the later that you apply, uh, the more beneficial it can be to you. Because you can kind of see, right, well... Uh, on the one hand, it could mean that the title that you want has already been filled up. So this, this group that's coming in here now, they basically only have these two that they can go for. But they can see that to get this one is going to be a couple of points less than trying to take this one. And that's exactly what they do. They actually move in here and they take Fonteroig's spot. Not the feckless house. May they tread... So Fonteroig has refused to accept a marriage and we seem to be upset about that. I'm not really too sure why. So proposal rejected. This would put a member of our family in their court who we would still have a degree of control over, which is a very interesting aspect of the game. Like I said, with CK3, you have somebody in your family, you marry them off, they're now pretty much a liability to you. Or they could be a liability. And with CK3, you're only concerned about your character and who's going to inherit. And quite often, the easiest way of streamlining that is force everybody else to become a monk or a nun, or kill them. And those are two very valid strategies for CK3. Whereas here, you're really getting to experience, and I didn't point this out at the start, but it's very much going for the kind of the medieval, uh, well, Italian Renaissance period. And it's very much that court politics and the wider family politics and um, the kind of conniving. So maybe you want to keep your family, keep them alive the way they can be of use to you. It is choice to refuse my daughter's hand in marriage. Divils. I have no option but to... So we can see a couple of screens there. Diplomacy, trade, intrigue. Intrigue is what we've gone for and what it has done is we try to worsen our relations with Fonteroig. And we can see here that we have one of one spies. I'm not too sure is that they're countering or is that kind of... We're sending one of one. So that's our attack against their spy defense. I'm not too sure what that uh, what that means. But here is an attempt basically to slander them and to uh, worsen relations with them. Tell the truth. The cowards attacked our grain. So we're being told that the cowards have attacked our grain supply. Uh, army led by Nestoro Fantoroig stops Tusco Tulliers on the road. Uh, Nestoroi does not let him pass unless Tusco explains his mission. And we have here the war is not a concern of House Tulliers. Uh, the delegation must pass. So your figures will have a an actual presence on the map, which is Something that's only recently been kind of added to CK3, they will wander about the map, they will travel from court to court to establish diplomatic relations, they can be stopped, as in this case here, by a very high martial figure, very good martial, uh, they can be stopped, and the implication here is that this is, is going to lead to war. In caravan, a foolish mistake. Our war is now a right. So we've now officially Our declared event. war against them. Okay, this is pretty much one of the interesting areas, and this is my first experience of war. I've seen images of this before in the past, but uh, haven't actually gotten to experience it. This is what war in Great Houses of Caldaria looks like. So if you watch any of the previous playthroughs that I've done, any of the demos that I've done before in the past, you'll have seen that there are these things called social conflicts, which look pretty much identical to this. In general, however, uh, one of these nodes will be coloured gold, we'll say, for example. And you will be able to line your characters... We'll say, okay, we'll say here. And the opponent will line them here. And the goal is for them to hop forward, um, get to nodes adjoining the one that is coloured gold, and attack it. And we can see some attacks here proceeding along these lines. So... Uh, this node here, for example, it could attack here, it could attack here, and it could attack here, and it could attack here. So it can attack along any lines connecting it. So it couldn't attack down. And we'd have a little bar which would fill up. And when that bar filled up, whatever side filled up the bar would have victory by attacking 
the gold uh, node in the center. However, you can also attack the your enemy components. So here we can see a swordsman. Here we can see a uh, horseman. I think these are pikemen. I'm not actually too sure. And we can see the lines of attack are heading out towards their pikemen. And there is their health all along the outside. And once that reaches uh, down to the bottom, they're going to be removed from the screen or they're going to be removed to one of these positions. And here we have two in reserve. They are currently recuperating, and they could be dragged onto the map to attack along the, the, the axes or the lines. Here are our components. I'm used to seeing these actually as circles as well. So we can see that we have Alana, who I believe is the head of the household, or is um, was somebody who declared war. I think they have a pikeman skill. We have two pikemen, we have two archers, uh, we have what looks uh, looks like a horseman and a uh, swordsman, and they are, like I said, attacking along these lines. So war is handled as an abstraction, and I think this is a fantastic middle ground between CK3 and Vicky3. It's abstract, it's abstracted out. Social negotiations and war is abstracted, yet there is still the tactical element of actually moving your troops about the screen. We're going to see that in a few moments. And we're also going to see uh, that there can be multiple, I don't know what you'd call this, a theater or a table. So we let it run on for a few more seconds. Justified. Winning this battle so here's will troops maneuvering. our claim to our title. My... Okay, so we have, we have three tables here. Um... I don't know exactly what they are. I haven't seen them before, but we have a little red face and we have a little green face. A little happy little green face on the, the three tables. I have seen in previous demos for the social conflicts, and a social conflict might represent the negotiation of a trade deal, the negotiation of the common one in the demo was your overlord attempting to drive up your taxes. And you have these three tables, and each one of them represents an attempt, we'll say, to impose a 25% tax penalty. So if you lose one of them, you're paying 25% extra taxes. If you win one of them, you're gaining, uh, you're paying 25% less. And what you have to do is you have to weigh up, do I want to devote all my forces, be they negotiators or be they military? Do I want to negotiate them to all three of the conflicts or do I want to just um, focus on a specific area? So here we have our character, our the, the leader of this military unit, who's going to be um, positioned somewhere now shortly. We can see that the enemy has four aligned here along the, the areas where they can bring troops onto the table. I'm not too sure what the objective is. I think it's to get to the other side and to claim at least one, if not all, of these pieces, or maybe to drive everyone from the, uh, from the table. Uh, we have our pikemen, our archers, our... Cavalry units, so it's pretty much the same as the last time. My son's daring attack down the center will Look prove his mettle and win prestige. We were victorious, but uh, their flanking attacks burned our farms and cost us more grain. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll go back and we'll take a look at a couple of things that we've seen here. Because like I said, this is my first actual look at warfare. Some of these units started here. We, as we're bringing our guy onto the field, we can actually see that Staring attack down the, the enemy forces have already moved forward. So there was a horseman here has moved across, and I think their starting general has moved across, basically blocked the archer to protect the archer. We can see from the images that the archers are firing over um, other units and other other tiles and these units then are coming onto the table they're going to be back here and they're going to try and push forward so all of the effort is being put in, onto this middle battle uh, this guy is pushing forward to attack the pikemen and to attack their uh, opposing uh, commander the center will prove his metal and so here is a rather bad scenario because i would imagine that we're looking at a rock paper scissors type approach uh, horsemen are strong against archers, pikemen are strong against horsemen, I'd imagine then that swordsmen are strong against pikemen, and depending on their traits, your generals might be strong or weak against each other. 
and win prestige. And we can see the horseman actually is getting decimated. Those numbers are going down very heavily. So we can see the, the pikemen have taken very little damage. And the horseman has taken a tremendous, tremendous chunk of damage. Uh, that led's in a, a strange scenario, but he's, he's doing a good, he's doing a good effort at the moment. We were victor so again, what is the victory condition here? I'm not too sure. All of these squares are now green, so we've obviously made it all the ways across the, the board and taken everything, and we've won this combat. Everything gets pulled off the table, and we can now send them to other areas. So the decision was made here to concentrate on the planes. And we have these simultaneous battles going on. So here we have the plains, the hillsides, and the flanks. In a social negotiation, this might represent uh, the main negotiation that's going on at the table between the two heads of the families. Here is your attractive daughter at the bar, or maybe a courtesan, because you can get special characters by building certain buildings. So maybe a courtesan trying to uh, get the the economic advisor of the rival family, get them drunk. And the the lines of attack, as I call them, here it's a military attack, but it can also serve in an abstract way for a debate or a discussion or an argument between two individuals. So lots of lots of potential, lots of interesting potential in these, uh, these abstract uh, representations. So we've won this battle, we're going to win this one as well and lose this one. Darius, but... Uh... Their flanking attacks bombed our farms and cost us. So we see here the, the victory. Crops minus 15, wine plus 15, prestige plus 15. I'm purely guessing, but I imagine the reward for winning the middle was plus 15 prestige, and maybe the cost was minus 15 prestige. Uh, over here it was plus 15 wine, and maybe there was a similar cost. And over here, then, it was plus 15 crops for winning and minus 15 for losing. So what you have to do is, basically, and it's the same with the negotiations, you need to weigh up what order do you want to fight these battles in, or do you want to devote all of your troops to a specific area? If you're really strong at making crops, maybe you can suffer the loss of the flank while concentrating your forces on gaining the prestige from the middle, and defending the vineyards. Or maybe if you're in a position where you have forces that are, uh, you know you're not going to win the battle, the overall conflict, but maybe if you can keep chipping away at the enemy's crop supply, if you can keep sending in units, keep harassing their crops, um, I'm not too sure are these units killed or what does this look like? Do they just get driven off the, the field? Do they have to spend a period of time recuperating? Is there a total annihilation of the enemy forces like you would have in a Total War game or CK3? Not too sure what uh, what that actual aspect looks like. A small grain. It was worth it. Once the Viceroy approves, we shall have our prize. So we've won the Herald of Goodwill. So the implication there is that by winning that battle, it has strengthened our grasp on the Herald of Goodwill, and indeed we can actually see defensive war participation is giving us a boost, and defensive wars won is giving us a boost. So if we managed true intrigue to actually force, or not force, but basically encourage uh, that house to declare war on us, and then win that war, either true alliances that we formed with other houses, or through uh, just pure military strength or whatever, uh, that would actually then impact our ability to hold on to our title of Herald of Goodwill. We keep the title heartfelt by seizing the hearts of our enemies. So if you look over some of the demos that I've put up previously, you'll see that it's all social negotiations. There was no military impact, or no military uh, available, no military options available. I don't think there was even all that many intrigue options available. It was pretty much trade. Trade and uh, managing your internal economy. Those were the two main options. But when you build buildings, you can recruit courtesans, you can recruit, I think, builders or something like that. There's like wine experts, a sommelier, or whatever the, the title is, the guy that'll pour your wine for you. And you can bring them 
into negotiations with you, and you can have them debate against the a spy from a from a rival household or a courtesan from a rival household. The game is going to allow modding. It's going to allow you to to make mods, and it's very easy to imagine. I think. Bene Gesserit, Sadukar generals. Fremen, sure. Members of House Atreides. Handling negotiations in this way that is provided here by the game. It actually has a way of emulating, it abstracts out social negotiations and social conflicts in a way that we haven't really seen in a game before. So I think that is probably the strongest advert that this game has, and it's the, the part that I'm most excited to see how it works. Taking part in the court politics of an empire. We heard it's the year 1314 of the Emperor. Uh, there's potentially magic in the game. There's an island that is ruled by the Mathemagicians. There's a lot of giant statues that are littered about the area. Uh, there's a giant volcano. There's a big dam somewhere. And... There's a lot of, of different options that make this a really interesting system. There's a lot of really interesting innovations here. It's going in a different direction to a lot of the games that we've seen by focusing on the court politics and the intrigue. So those are the aspects uh, that I'm most excited to see. And when this game comes out, uh, I'll be picking up one of the founder's copies if I'm able to do so. Uh, when it comes out on the 20th of July, and I'd be hoping to uh, get some videos up on the other channel as soon as possible, as soon as I'm actually able to, to do so, and get an idea of how these systems and these game mechanics work. So I think there's a tremendous amount of potential here. There's a tremendous amount of potential in these game mechanics. It's a new and innovative way of handling social conflicts, and it allows the devs to bring in aspects that have been maybe underserved or served poorly in other games to date and like I said I'd really like to see somebody make an attempt at a dune mod for great houses of Caldaria or something like that or maybe maybe even a, a different fantasy or sci-fi fiction that's heavy on the intrigue and politics you could do a game of thrones mod here that again focuses predominantly on the court politics of a kingdom as opposed to the wider kind of military affairs. So there you go. That is my look at the Great Houses of Caldaria Founders trailer. What do you think? Does this look like it could be something of interest to you? If you're a CK3 player, does this scratch a certain itch that the game doesn't have or doesn't provide? Or do you not really care about the court politics? Do you not really care about the, the intrigue? Do let me know in the comments below. Like I said, I plan playing this over on the Maniacal r d channel when it comes out, so please do go and give that a check, and thank you all very much for joining me today, and I hope to see you again in future.